I just want to read you an email that I was sent uh, last year by somebody who said, uh, I find that gazing at pictures of crop circles brings on a very meditative state. Uh, and I love to use your book because there isn't a lot of text to distract me and the photographs are stunning. How's that for a plug? <laughs> uh, and as she was looking at the pictures, she said a word came into her mind, a word that she'd never heard of before, and that word was didactic. So she looked it up in the dictionary and found that it said, designed or intended to teach, intended to convey instruction and information, as well as pleasure and entertainment. And many, many people over the years have said to me, what is the purpose of crop circles? What is behind them? Well, I think in the last 20, 25 years, I've learned more um, researching this subject than I ever have for the rest of my life. It contains every single ology, theology, biology, uh, archaeology, every single ology you can possibly think of, as well as the spiritual side. And to combine the two, I think between the crop circles, they are a perfect medium for combining science and spirituality. Um, last year, I was invited to um, give a talk, well, two conferences, in Taos, New Mexico. Now, Taos is a little town up in the hills and, well, up in the mountains, and it lies 7,000 feet up below towering snow-capped mountains. And it's a, t a town of literati, uh, poets, sculptors, writers. And this man is called Nikolai Fechin. He, we don't really know much about him in the West. He was very famous in Russia, just before the Russian Revolution. A brilliant, brilliant artist. And he has a museum. He married somebody from the Roman aristocracy, I mean the Russian aristocracy. And she had to flee during the uh, Russian Revolution. Uh, they met up again afterwards and they came to America and they settled in Taos. And he built his own home. And it's a museum, and that is one of his wonderful, wonderful uh, pencil drawings. And if you look at the, the thumbnail, it's wonderfully illuminated. But as well as being a town of literati, it's also one of the few places in the States which has a national heritage site for the Pueblo Indians. And I visited their uh, reservation, and that's one of their adobes. Now, that is showing windows and doors, but in the old days, they didn't have any windows or doors. doors. They just had holes in the roof, and they would go up and down by ladder, and this was in order to protect them against the marauding other tribes or uh, against the white man. And, of course, the white man eventually took over and donated, uh, as a present, the fiery liquid of liquor. And this is something they suffer from. But the conference was quite one of the happiest I've ever been to. It was a conference of sharing and joy and spirituality and, and learning. And this was just one of the um, uh, North American Indians, the Pueblo Indians, and I think it's such a noble face. It's the personification of the best quality of the North American Indians. Noble, wise, uh, just fantastic. And um, there was another very, very special North American Indian there. Well, he, in fact, he was a Toltec Indian called Tlacatel. Uh, now, Tlacatel was 80, maybe he's 88 now, but he has visited people all over the world. He's um, visited the Dalai Lama. And when he heard of my connection with the Mohawk, North American Indians, because both my sons, uh, through a very strange happening, are initiated Mohawk Indians, deeply honored. 
And so when Talakatel heard about this, he said he'd like to do a workshop with me. And again, I was hugely thrilled by this. So we did this workshop, and oh, well over 100 people were there. And I sat on the edge of the stage, and he, his English is, he understands English, but it's not very good, so he had an interpreter. People asked questions, and we told stories all day long. I can tell stories all day long, just like the lorries can tell stories all day long. And so could Talakatel. And we went way beyond our time. And I think it was one of the happiest days. But Talakatel was saying, people said to him, now what about 2012? And he said, the shift started in 1947. And he wouldn't be moved from this. And I was just thinking, what happened in 1947? It was very soon after Hiroshima. It was the year of Roswell. And I think it was the first year, maybe somebody will correct me, that the speed of sound was, was broken and by an American. I think I'm right in that. Um, so it was, he then said, well, it would reach a sort of crescendo because over the last 20 years, 15 to 20 years, things have happened in our lives, catastrophes, traumas, earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, war in the Middle East, Egypt starting war in the Middle East, unheard of things. And he says it'll come to a crescendo, it's built up to a crescendo at the end of 2012, and then he said it'll just go back to normal. He wasn't fussed at all. And one of the evenings we went to um, a labyrinth which had been constructed by somebody called Akhtar, another North American Indian. And there were 1,352 little candles in uh, brown paper bags, and they had sand in them, and we put candles in. And it was a specially designed uh, labyrinth, 1,352, which is 13 times 13 times 8. Now, I've forgotten the significance of that, and I sent an email the other day hoping to get an answer, and I haven't got it. But maybe you, one of you, might know the significance of 1352. But as you can see from this picture, there were a whole lot of orbs, and in particular, one on the... Well, I can't see. I think it must be on... Let me have a look. Yes, on the left-hand side. And when I was talking to Actor about them, he said, oh, those are the spirits of his ancestors. Come to visit us during the evening to be with us. He was very happy about that. And that orb on the left-hand side seems almost as though it's got information in it. And there you can see it even more clearly. And I sent that up to uh, Jim Lance, with whom I do a tremendous amount of work. He's a polymath, and we're writing a book together. And he said, the orb has a center small sphere surrounded by three shells. This is the same model as we find for basic structure of atoms, galaxies, and crop circles, but with no radials. And he said, all this is new stuff as far as I'm concerned and follows the basic rules of plasma physics. So, exciting stuff. And we visited many labyrinths. I got quite selective by the end. And this was a wonderful one, uh, bordering on the Rio Grande. And as um, um, Maria was talking this morning about the geomancy of the land, the importance of putting the things in the right place, the spirit of the land. They know where to put these labyrinths, and they are, as a result, full of amazing energy. And this one in particular, and uh, when I walk around a labyrinth, or just as Maria was saying, when you go up to a stone, you go up with your hands, palms outstretched. And walking around the labyrinth, I would walk around and I'd come to a point in the labyrinth where the energy was so terrific, I'd literally have to shake it off. 